Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Nargis Kasyanova, and I'm director of the program on Central Asia at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Thank you for joining us today. We will talk about the Organization for Security and Cooperation and in Europe and um, Central Asia, what has been happening to their organization and its engagement with Central Asian countries in times of crisis, uh, with Russia's war against uh, Ukraine rendering a major blow to uh, European security and to the organization established as a bridge between the East and the West in the 1970s. And of course, uh, the war and all the developments are also a major blow to the Eurasian post-Soviet order that Central Asia is uh, part of. Uh, today, Central Asian states find themselves at the sharp end of the growing uh, geopolitical rivalry between East and the West. And actually, I, I would say it's more complicated. There are uh, different uh, East, uh, different Easts now. Uh, it's a multipolar uh, multipolar world, and how they manage to position themselves and what ties um, they can man maintain or develop will uh, determine um, determine their future. So uh, there is a lot to discuss, and we have um, a great panel with us today. And let me introduce our panelists in the order I will ask them uh, to speak. We will start with Professor Stefan Wolf, uh, who is Professor of International Security at the University of Birmingham. Uh, his work focuses on international conflict management, especially in the context of geopolitics and great power rivalries in the post-Soviet space. Uh, he is co-coordinator of the OEC Network of Think Tanks and Academic Institutions. Uh, and a senior research fellow at the Foreign Policy Center, and also a founding editor of Ethnopolitics. Um, for, for this discussion, it's particularly important that um, Professor Wolf is the principal, the principal co-author of the report, The OAC and Central Asia, Options for Engagement in the Context of Crisis in Afghanistan and the War in Ukraine, published by the OEC Network of Think Tanks and um, Academic Institutions. Um, well, I have a printout here, but we'll also share the link to the um, to the report. Thank you very much, Stefan, for joining us today. Um, <clears throat> then we will go to Professor Paul Dunai, who is a professor of NATO and European security issues at the George uh, Marshall European Center for Security Studies at uh, Garmisch. Partenkirchen in Germany. He's also an associate uh, professor at the Faculty of Social Sciences of Loran at Walsh University in Budapest. Uh, between 2014 and uh, 16, he was director of the OSC Academy in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. And between 1996 and 2014, he worked at the Geneva Center for Security Policy and also as a researcher at the Stockholm uh, International Peace Research um, Institute. Very warm welcome to you as well. Um, <clears throat> then we will go to Dr. Alexandra uh, Dines, who is a senior researcher at the um, at the First Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Regional Office for Cooperation and Peace in Europe in Vienna. Uh, she specializes in political economy and the foreign policy of Russia and the post-Soviet uh, space. Previously, she taught international relations and political economy at the University of Amsterdam, and she's an affiliated research fellow in the political science department and has worked for the European Parliament in Brussels. Thank, thank you for joining us today, Alexander. Um, last but not least, uh, we will hear from Dr. Erkin Tukumov, who is a director of Kazakhstan Institute for Strategic Studies under the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Uh, prior to the appointment to this position in January 2022, uh, he had served as Minister Council of the Embassy of Kazakhstan in Russia, Consul General of the Republic of Kazakhstan in Kazan, head of the analytical department um, of the Security Council of the Republic of Kazakhstan, and Director and Deputy Director of the Central Asia Department of the Ministry of Foreign uh, affairs of uh, Kazakhstan. He holds a degree of the Candidate of Sciences from Institute of Philosophy and Political Science at the Academy of Sciences of the Republic of Kazakhstan. And I also am happy to note that he has an MPA from uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard Kennedy School. So thank, thank you very much for joining us here, Kim. So um, without further ado, uh, let me go to, uh, to you, Stefan. Um, could you uh, 
could you share the findings of the report that you co-authored, uh, reflect on the uh, current moment, how it affects the OEC, how it affects uh, OEC engagement in Central Asia? The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nargis. Uh, also, thank you very much to the Davis Center for um, having uh, agreed uh, to host this uh, webinar. Uh, let me start uh, by uh, briefly acknowledging that uh, whilst I'm uh, one of the uh, authors of this uh, report, uh, I'm only one of them. Um, we were four colleagues uh, working on this uh, uh, together. So alongside me, there were Anastasia Bayok and uh, Rahimullah Kakar, who are both uh, based at the Center for OSC Research at the University of Hamburg in Germany and uh, Niva Yao, who is uh, a senior uh, researcher at the OSC Academy in Bishkek. Um, then, of course, uh, none of uh, uh, this would have been possible without the generous funding of the German Federal uh, Foreign Office, which I want to acknowledge here. And I also uh, want to uh, say thank you to uh, the uh, many people who uh, agreed uh, to uh, give us uh, their time uh, in researching uh, this report. Uh, in total, uh, between um, uh, the autumn of 2021 and the summer of 2022, we conducted uh, 62 uh, semi-structured interviews and three uh, focus groups. And we also had uh, the benefit of uh, 41 uh, uh, specifically commissioned um, expert input papers uh, that helped us uh, work on the uh, report. So this was very much a collective uh, uh, effort uh, which I have uh, uh, the honor of uh, presenting to you um, in, in terms of the main uh, findings. Um, so let me begin uh, uh, with uh, the three uh, principal uh, um, sort of insights that we gained uh, uh, from our research on uh, where the OSCE or how the OSCE can now engage with uh, Central Asia in the context of uh, the crisis in Afghanistan, so um, basically since the takeover of the Taliban in August 2021, and then the uh, additional uh, impact that the war in Ukraine has had uh, on the region and on the organization uh, uh, since uh, February uh, last year. Um, so the first uh, uh, finding that we had was clearly that Russia's influence in Central Asia is uh, uh, declining. Uh, and uh, just three uh, obvious points of uh, evidence uh, uh, for that uh, from what we learned uh, in our research is that Central Asian states generally uh, have not been undercutting any of the Western uh, sanctions uh, against uh, Russia. There has been very limited, if any, political support for Russia in public international fora in the context of the war in Ukraine. And we have also seen uh, Russia's leverage over the region uh, uh, decrease in times of uh, crisis. Uh, for example, um, when uh, the border tensions between uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan uh, escalated again uh, last year, uh, Russia was not um, in a similarly strong position uh, to uh, intervene uh, there as it was or would have been uh, maybe a, a few years uh, ago. Um, now, uh, the second uh, uh, point that we make in the report is that obviously this declining Russian influence uh, uh, leaves a void uh, in the region. Um, but China is the other uh, major uh, uh, power um, uh, directly bordering uh, uh, the region so far has uh, uh, been shown uh, or has shown itself quite reluctant uh, uh, to step into uh, the void left behind uh, by Russia. Um, and again, sort of three uh, points of evidence uh, uh, for that to, to mention here. Uh, first of all, um, Russia has, uh, sorry, uh, China has not been uh, uh, trying to push uh, Russia uh, out of Central Asia in a very proactive uh, uh, way. But what we have seen is that um, uh, China has set uh, clearer and more explicit, uh, more explicit uh, boundaries uh, for how it sees um, uh, or where it sees the parameters of Russian conduct uh, in the region. And perhaps the key moment uh, uh, here, um, uh, in my view, was uh, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, visit, visit to um, uh, to Kazakhstan uh, uh, last autumn. Uh, when he very explicitly uh, stated um, 
China's support for Kazakhstan's uh, territorial integrity and uh, uh, sovereignty at a time when there uh, were uh, quite a few rumors about uh, Russia trying to destabilize uh, uh, Kazakhstan, in particular northern Kazakhstan, uh, with its large um, Russian and uh, Russian-speaking uh, minority. Um, second point in terms of China being uh, reluctant uh, to uh, take uh, over uh, from, from Russia's uh, leadership is that so far, um, China's engagement with Central Asia remains predominant uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic uh, connections. Uh, there has been uh, uh, in, uh, an increasing but still very small military footprint that uh, uh, China uh, has. So from that perspective, um, there, there hasn't been the, the kind of uh, sort of security uh, uh, guarantees uh, that uh, China um, sort of has put uh, uh, forward that uh, uh, Russia used to provide uh, for the region in, uh, in previous decades. Uh, so that leaves us then uh, uh, with the question uh, that, that we ask in the report, whether we are going to see in the future here a managed transition uh, from Russian to Chinese regional uh, hegemony. And I think personally that this is uh, quite likely, but it will be a relatively slow uh, uh, process. Um, and then the final uh, uh, point in terms of what's going on in the region is that um, given a, a sort of Russia's uh, uh, decline and uh, at the same time uh, China not uh, really stepping uh, up uh, to the plate uh, as yet. Um, there has been uh, uh, an opportunity that to some extent has been used by the Central Asian states uh, uh, themselves uh, for more regional self-organization. Uh, um, so that uh, I think has been driven uh, uh, by three um, uh, distinct uh, factors. The first one is that existing forms of regional organization uh, so far have not been able uh, to manage uh, the uh, uncertainties which uh, uh, the region uh, and the individual states there are facing. Uh, so neither the uh, Eurasian Economic Union nor the CSTO nor the SCO, uh, I think really have been uh, up to the, uh, to the task here. Um, also, the countries in the region have quite obviously shared uh, uh, security concerns. Um, but at the same time, they also uh, still have bilateral disputes and conflicts uh, with each other. Um, and then the final point, uh, I think, in this context is the, that there have been growing, growing attempts by uh, secondary or so-called middle powers to gain a foothold uh, uh, in the region. So in particular, uh, I think Turkey, but also Iran, India, Pakistan, and the Gulf states. Uh, so all of this has created, uh, I think, a greater need and a great, greater awareness uh, uh, among the states of uh, Central Asia that actually a degree of self-organization in the region would be uh, useful. Uh, so where does that leave the OSCE? Well, I think, first of all, uh, any role that the OSCE can have in the region uh, is very much a function of uh, the constraints that the organization is currently uh, uh, facing. Uh, so there's a high degree of internal dysfunctionality, obviously, because uh, of the fallout from the war uh, in uh, Ukraine, the uh, increasing uh, isolation of uh, Russia and its few remaining allies in the organization, but therefore also the inability of the organization to really function in the way uh, that it uh, did arguably um, at least until uh, February last year. Um, then there is, uh, uh, from a Central Asian perspective, but also from the perspective of the organization more widely, uh, quite a high degree of contestation uh, over the um, so-called comprehensive security agenda uh, of the OSCE. So that security uh, in that sense is uh, both a question of political uh, military security, of economic and environmental security, but also of human uh, uh, security. And that latter dimension uh, obviously is perhaps not the uh, one that is uh, most openly and enthusiastically embraced by the states of Central Asia. Um, and then of course, um, uh, despite of what I said on the, um, on the last slide, uh, in terms of the uh, limitations of existing formats of regional organization, 
We nevertheless have to uh, bear in mind that there are alternatives that the Central Asian states uh, potentially have to engagement with the OSCE, namely the SCOC car, but uh, to a limited extent also the uh, CSTO. So uh, from, from that perspective, the OSCE is not the only, uh, and uh, for the time being, I would say probably also not the most effective uh, player in the region when it comes to the security needs and concerns of states and societies there. So finally then, uh, what options uh, do exist for OSCE uh, engagement? Uh, I think the first one would be um, that the OSCE can really make a contribution here to facilitate regional uh, uh, self-organization. And what we emphasize in the report in particular is that that uh, would perhaps most usefully start with the OSCE's second dimension. Uh, in relation to economic and environmental uh, security. Uh, so uh, questions of um, uh, connectivity uh, are very important here, uh, but also environmental change and in particular uh, uh, the climate uh, uh, security dimension, I think are very important here. Uh, second, um, what uh, really um, is uh, in quite high demand uh, uh, according to um, what we found in our uh, research is a need uh, uh, expressed by um, the Central Asian states, especially those that directly border Afghanistan, uh, for the OSCE to maintain its support for border security, border management, uh, but also um, managing the risks uh, from um, emanating from violent uh, extremism and radicalization that might potentially lead uh, uh, to terrorism. Um, but finally, and that brings me back to the comprehensive security that. Um, concept of the OSCE, I think it's also important to continue support for the human uh, dimension. Uh, in particular here, I think uh, women's rights, there are still uh, opportunities, uh, minority rights, um, but also something that the OSCE has been reasonably good at uh, in the past, namely integrating human rights training uh, into uh, the engagement that it has on hard security issues which very often is an easier sell uh, to the governments in uh, the region. Uh, so from that perspective, there are options uh, uh, for the OSCE to engage with uh, uh, the region uh, at the moment and uh, going forward. But I do think they are quite constrained in terms of what the organization itself at the moment uh, can deliver. On that note, thank you very much. And I'm handing back to Norris. Thank you very much, Stefan. Well, you put a lot on the plate. I already have quite a, quite a few questions, but let's go. Let's go to to um, Professor Dunai. Uh, Paul. Uh, well, Stefan already talked about the comprehensive security approach agenda of uh, of the OEC and three baskets: uh, military, political, um, economic, environmental, and human um, human dimension. Uh, so. What is happening? Do you see any shifts in the in the approach in the agenda? The what's happening with the in the uh, debate on dimensions and um, um, do we are we seeing or uh, shall we see any kind of trade offs between military, political, and human di dimension baskets or maybe some complementarity in a new interesting interesting way? So what what are your thoughts? Thank you very much, Nargis Kasenovat, for the invitation and to the Davis Center. Uh, as I have six, seven minutes, I have a written text uh, which will address some of these issues directly or indirectly. Uh, and I would start with arms control because I was told that Paul Mill dimension has something to do with arms control. And as I happen to be one of the negotiators of the CFE Treaty and then the Open Skies Agreement, uh, I have some idea about it. At least I have some good memories. Uh, from spending my time in Vienna uh, in 1989-90 and again in 1992. Uh, so even though the arms control achievements of the OSC and in the OSC area were realized upon the end of the Cold War and in the first years of the post-Cold War era, it's clear that in contrast with the 1990s, the 21st century showed no further advancement rather than backtracking in this area. The CFE Treaty and its adaptation agreement are dead. The Open Skies Treaty shares the fate of the CFE with some delay. 
And I attribute this more to a number of ill-advised US administrations, Republican administrations actually, that were not seeking compromise being carried away by their own self-perceived overpowering rather than by anything else. There is nothing new under the sun, one would say. Fred Ickley, an American government official, uh, already raised the question 62 years ago when he asked, after detection, what? What shall a party to a treaty do when she notices that the other party was cheating? And the question is, did Russia cheat? And the answer is, yes, it did. Did its most often technical violations change the strategic equation in the CFE and also in open skies more recently? The answer is no. Of course, the US leadership, when it blocked the ratification of the CFE adaptation agreement for NATO as such, uh, found an excellent partner in the Russian leadership that prepared for and then implemented the military reform in the last 12 years since the introduction of the first national armaments plan that found military transparency as an obstacle to realizing its plans. This means that although the confidence and security building measures of the OSC are alive, but they are not well either. In particular, as a number of conflicts gained higher intensity and a few others, like the frozen conflict between Georgia and its separatist territories, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, interfere with the realization of various measures, including transparency measures. Further, in 2013, when Ukraine as OSC chairmanship country put forward a foot for thought paper, we learned or rather faced its reconfirmation Arms control is a game played by great powers, and it is up to them to have arms control in the OSC or not. In the first decade of this century, Russia had an issue with rebalancing the political military dimension with the humanitarian dimension, while some excellent experts invented status neutral arms control that went nowhere. The matter vanished as we had to realize that various measures simultaneously belong to different dimensions. So the, the dimension debate lost its relevance because we had to notice that very often uh, one dimension is uh, overlapping with another when we speak about policing issues, when we speak about any kind of conflict, it immediately has major impact on uh, humanitarian dimension related matters and so on and so forth. So uh, we, uh, ended up in a blind alley uh, that uh, surrounded the debates of the OSC. And of course, uh, without being harshly critical about the OSC, I have to say the delegates invest time and effort and the OSC looks like a spinning wheel without much tangible achievement. We must also be aware that the security needs of different regions of the 55 participating states, strong OSC, are different. And hence, the idea of an undifferentiated approach to arms control doesn't mean much. It is not surprising that the most remarkable success of European arms control is associated with the two post-Dayton agreements in the Western Balkans, agreements specific to the region where both structural and operational arms control were realized in their framework that have also been fully implemented. However, the single most important matter is that the political military dimension has lost its arms control focus and gained a conflict management emphasis. There it would be difficult to report about resounding success either. Acute conflicts are with us, many of them moved to negative peace, but most, except for some in the Western Balkans, did not cross the boundary line from negative peace to positive peace. And this very much characterizes a number of conflicts also in Central Asia, which are not so central to the attention of the OSC. I may even say that many countries find Central Asia simply a bridge too far. The Russian war of aggression against Ukraine on 24 February 2022 reduced the attention to all other conflicts, even more to ones where Russia is not a direct or indirect player. It seems most low intensity conflicts in Central Asia fall into this category. Even though the regime change in Afghanistan temporarily increased the attention, the region, the region seems to be a bridge too far, as I mentioned, for most other participating states. 
It is fortunate, however, that the autocracies, the anocracies, and the mixed regimes of Central Asia do not contest attention to the political military dimension. Most of them have far more of a problem with the human dimension. And of course, we have memorable experience here, not only with Uzbekistan in the past and Turkmenistan, two countries which were certainly uh, the most dictatorial, and one of them is still dictatorial as we speak, uh, but also uh, with other uh, countries. Um, it's necessary to mention that there are states that tend to exaggerate the horizontal escalation potential of the Afghan malaise, and they often do it in order to attract attention, sympathy, support with their security, and financial assistance without facing large scale, even less existential challenge from their southern neighbor. It is constructed rather than real. This leaves me in doubt about the report's strong understanding towards Tajikistan and the element of exaggeration in the negative assessment of Turkmenistan. The most positive changes are due to internal processes of states like the end of the dual power structure in Kazakhstan, its constructive role in regional processes together with the positive role of Uzbekistan that took Tashkent out of being a source of problem in Central Asia and moved it to being a part of the solution since September 2016. Let's hope that in spite of the noticeable tendency to the opposite, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan will find their way to join the new positive trend in Central Asia that the OSC will then be in the position to support and foster by its actually quite limited means. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we will definitely return to, to this bridge too far, bridge too far uh, <laughs> point um, that, that you made and to, to, to other excellent points that, that you made. Can we go to you, um, Alexandra, now? Uh, well, um, Stefan, uh, Stefan mentioned that, that the environmental, uh, well, the economic environmental dimension is a very promising dimension with the climate change and, and all that. Uh, so uh, what's, what's your take on that? What's, what's happening in this basket? Then? What can be done? Thank you very much, Nargis, and thank you, Davis Center, for having me today. Um, I must say that in one way or another, I have been studying the lack of regional integration in Central Asia for quite some time. And it's interesting that this problem basically still persists. And this is why I think speaking of the second dimension and potentials that exist there for the OEC, we should first of all speak about the persisting economic difficulty and difficulty in regional economic cooperation in the region, because this is like the defining uh, framework for, um, for further discussion, I think. Um, already 10 years ago, I did some uh, ethnographic research in the region uh, studying trade barriers, uh, including interviews with many kind of on the ground stakeholders, starting with farmers uh, up to traders, um, border customs, guards, um, etc. And it was interesting to find out that next to maybe some traditional and um, uh, to be expected trade barriers like corruption, like complicated border procedures, like political difficulties uh, among the countries that have been persisting for a long time already. Uh, one of the major problems is the lack of, um, you know, production capacity in the countries, lack of um, abilities to actually tr add value to the products that are being, um, um, grown, for instance, in the region, like agricultural products, which are among the, the main export goods. And this is obviously a, a general problem of underdevelopment. This does not only pertain to Central Asia, but this big uh, economic problem certainly still persists in the region and, and uh, kind of um, is, is one of the perhaps obstacles to, to further economic development and integration. Um, there are also various um, maybe strands of discussion in academic literature, like I have been looking in, in my academic research together with my colleague Sebastian Krapel at the University of Amsterdam, looking at, again, reasons for lack of economic integration in the region. 
Among them, we know authoritarian countries tend to maybe be less prone to form regional organizations and cooperate um, border disputes, political disagreements, etc. But in Central Asia, particularly, what we found an, an interesting fact of the lack of regional cooperation is the special position of Kazakhstan as one of, of the um, regional um, powerful countries, regional strongholds. This country is locked in integration with Russia through Eurasian Economic Union, as we know, and partly kind of sacrifices the potential gains that may arise from cooperation with Central Asian states for the sake of uh, closer relations with Russia. So in game theoretical terms, kind of playing a regional Rambo and um, not investing uh, instead in, in integration with its regional neighbors. And then later on in my day job at the Friedrich Hebert Foundation, I looked again in, in uh, opportunities and obstacles to cooperation looking particularly in how the Eurasian Economic Union functions and, and what the potentials are perhaps for engagement with the EU based on um, several stakeholder interviews in the region. This was already back in 2018 and I found that indeed there are perhaps many um, on the technical and economic realm, many points where the EU and Eurasian Economic Union could cooperate and how the OEC could facilitate this cooperation. But we know that many things changed since then. And, and this is why we speak today, the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan with um, negative repercussions for the region. And of course, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And here, I think the situation, perhaps in terms of the regional power balance, does not change completely fundamentally because countries also cannot escape their geography. However, the balance of power certainly shifts. Um, and here, I totally agree with the main conclusion of the report that we see several trends that kind of complement each other. First of them being, of course, the Russian decline. It's the weakening role of Russia in general because Russia uses a lot of resources, financial and, and, and other, in its war. So it has simply kind of less attention and less resources that can be um, uh, put to, to Central Asia. The second trend is, of course, a Chinese reluctance, as Stefan put it, and uh, as re re the report forcefully um, um, states, Chinese reluctance to, to jump into this void. And then new actors coming in, like, like Turkey, like Iran, and not clearly, with maybe no clear goals, how they want to, to shape this region uh, to their advantage. And on top of that, insufficiency of the regional organizations that are in the region, like CSTO, like the Shanghai Cooperation um, Organization. The look into trade statistics um, that I have been studying uh, certainly underpins these trends. We see that while in the 1990s, so after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when Central Asian markets were still strongly connected to Russia. Back in the 1990s, and even still in the early 2000s, Russia was the preeminent trade actor in the region, preeminent trade partner. The EU was also playing a role, and China was not yet a, a strong player in terms of trade. Now the situation is reversed. The Russian trade share has been continuously declining in all Central Asian states in, in the past 15, maybe even 20 years. Um, and the European part, European share has been also decreasing in most cases, especially in the case of Kazakhstan, only if I'm not mistaken, in, in the Kyrgyz case, it has been slightly rising. Uh, and of course, the Chinese share uh, is increasing very rapidly. So we see in economic terms that the region is kind of drifting away from Russia and coming closer and closer to China. Certainly it has also some political, perhaps even military repercussions because these trends kind of go hand in hand, but there seems to be still a certain division of labor between Russia and China with Russia still despite its decline being kind of more in charge for the, for the security in the region, but China certainly taking um, the preeminent uh, economic role um, 
Just a few words about the negative uh, economic repercussions for the region uh, in terms of the war, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine. Of course, we have an overall economic downturn in Russia due to the war and the Central Asian republics also notice it. Of course, they also suffer under this economic downturn, primarily because the remittances, payments from migrant workers, especially from uh, places like Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, many of whom work in, in Russia, they go down. Um, especially in these countries that I just mentioned, remittances, as we know, um, account for a significant part of GDP and the decline of remittances has really a negative and a palpable effect on, on the national economies. Russia has generally fewer resources to support uh, its Central Asian allies. So this factor, I believe, will not change in the foreseeable future because the war most likely will, will go on for quite some time still. And generally, I think economic cooperation with Russia, or in some cases, large reliance on Russia as an economic partner, is seen in the region not so much as an asset as it has been in the past, but more as a liability. And this certainly changes generally the strategic outlook for, for the governments in Central Asia. We shouldn't forget that the repercussions of the pandemic are still felt in the region, the disruption of value chains. Uh, this comes on top of the economic downturn in Russia and declining remittances. Um, and the migration uh, flow, by the way, even in some ways reversed because so many Russians actually emigrated at least for some time, went for some time to um, countries uh, such as Kazakhstan. It's thousands, probably um, dozens of thousands of, of Russian people, especially men who escaped the draft with economic consequences and political perhaps repercussions for the countries still um, unknown. I would like to mention some silver linings, perhaps, uh, that are also discussed in the report, and, and I wonder if um, it's maybe a bit too optimistic how I put it. Some countries might benefit, perhaps, from the sanction regime in the way that they may, may become a new kind of informal hub, transition hub for sanctioned goods. Um, I only know for sure the example of Armenia, so from another region, which now, according to trade statistics, appears to be a larger import and export of iPhones that we can imagine go to Russia. I think it may be the case also for some Central Asian countries, but this is certainly not the biggest silver lining we, we should be talking about. Um, Perhaps Central Asia could play a bigger role generally for the transit of goods from China to Europe. And here Belt and Road Initiative, of course, plays a role. But the OEC could, of course, step in with, with its through its connectivity agenda and see how it actually reinforced those green corridors that were mentioned in the report and how some alternative trade routes that bypass Russia, that go through the Black Sea and then the Balkans, can be um, examined. However, I agree with the limitation that the report mentions that countries of the region are generally so unstable and some political factors are so unpredictable that this may be a limitation on, on those new trade routes. Finally, as a perhaps silver lining might be a slightly bigger attention to the region from the EU. Now that Russian influence dwindles, Chinese influence expands, EU could be a powerful actor in the region that diverts attention, diverts resources, and um, kind of steps into the void. I think the new paradigm of democracies versus autocracies may be a limiting factor for such engagement, because in fact, many countries of the Central Asian region are autocracies, and in fact, might be even reluctant working together with the EU, seeing through the unprecedented sanctions regime that the EU was willing to put against Russia, seeing some risks related to, to uh, close economic cooperation with the EU. So in other words, how cooperation can from one day to another flip um, into embargoes and, and sanctions. And finally, potential entry points for the OEC, because finally, this is what, what, what is at stake now. As mentioned, connectivity agenda here, I fully agree. And as I already mentioned, this alternative trade route through Central Asia from China to Europe could be uh, one aspect. 
climate related risks and generally fighting climate change climate agenda this is together with water management and other environmental aspects i think a very promising route and here's where we can draw on field missions and the experience of the OEC on the ground. Of course, a limiting factor here is, like Stefan already mentioned, the general, um, to put it mildly, very difficult state in, in which the organization is now um, situated. It's the budget question, because the OEC still has no budget, but perhaps something can be achieved through extra budgetary projects, like we see even in the case of Ukraine, where basically, a, a, whole mission called special program Ukraine has been put up without a consensus uh, through extra budgetary contributions of, of many states. So maybe this is a way to go. Um, yeah, and of course, the extension of mandates of field missions is another factor. Maybe there can be a mechanism as mentioned in the report to extend them not on a yearly basis, but rather find a way to have um, maybe a more permanent mechanism to actually make sure that the OEC can work on the ground. Otherwise, um, there's no possibility to plan. There's no possibility for a longer term engagement. And of course, the OEC should also find a way of more institutionalized strategic dialogue with China, because as we have um, discussed today, China is a very important actor which is not inside the framework of the OEC, which is very important or increasingly important for the region, especially economically, which can be a powerful ally for the connectivity agenda, but which is effectively outside the scope of the OEC discussions because there's no institutionalized dialogue yet and China engages with the countries of the region rather bilaterally than multilaterally, and maybe OEC can help them to uh, speak with a stronger voice with China through the OEC. So this is from my side. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. That, that's a lot. And I think it's very important to talk about the practical practical things as well. Um, and um, on uh, rerouting, uh, the, yeah, it, is, uh, it is indeed the, well, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan that are also uh, participate in rerouting of uh, of goods uh, from from Europe to uh, from EU to um, to Russia as the uh, recent EBRD report uh, uh, report shows but uh, these are not all sanctioned uh, sanctioned goods and um, well president Takayev uh, put forward the idea of uh, Kazakhstan becoming the buffer as he said buffer economy between east and west north and south and that that's something that you know maybe you can also <laughs> discuss if we have time uh but can i can i go to you uh Yarkin? how 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 all these things look from from astana we had three european perspectives what's uh your our central asian perspective well uh, thank you Nargis. thank you david center for organizing this i think very important and wonderful event i i um, I don't think that I have uh, a kind of disagreement with uh, what already stated today. I, a, a lot of um, you very important and uh, right thing already mentioned. I just want to add why OECE is, is still important for, for the region. Uh, why I'm saying still because, well, what is the future for OECE? taking into account um, the, the conflict in Ukraine and the role of Russia, the future, I mean, the membership of Russia and everything. I mean, uh, that's uh, very important aspects for us. But uh, OEC is still important to the region uh, of Central Asia because Central Asia, it's already mentioned today that um, it's still more geographic region than political and economic, but uh, there is a progress for sure. There is an advancement of uh, to, to make the region more integrated. And, um, but um, uh, when I was in uh, Vienna and met, met with my colleagues from different think tanks, um, um, I, <clears throat> I said that the European security system ends uh, on the border of Central Asia with Afghanistan, because 
we are part, we are members of OEC, and uh, everything that uh, touch uh, security and cooperation of Central Asian states sooner or later uh, touch uh, Europe and security. So it it does matter for U U European countries to think about uh, uh, our security and, uh, and cooperation with us, um, and. Uh, and for, for the region, it's also important. Uh, for example, Kazakhstan uh, has sometimes much more in common with European countries. And uh, we are, uh, the majority of terrain of Kazakhstan belongs to Central Asia, but the Northern part of Kazakhstan belongs to Siberia. It's uh, North Asia. And uh, some part of Kazakhstan belongs to, let's say to, uh, West, uh, East European um, uh, region uh, on Ural River. So it's, uh, you know, we are a very mixed uh, country, but still we have a lot of in common uh, with, uh, with our um, uh, region partners. Um, and um, uh, uh, Nargis at the beginning asked me about what, uh, have, I, have I met with someone from OEC? Um, I think that they do a lot of activities in in Kazakhstan, particularly in this region, and not only uh, um, focus on uh, political basket. But there is a stable image of, of OEC in Kazakhstan or in Central Asia uh, as a kind of organization, mostly for election monitoring and uh, and the human rights. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we we couldn't develop our uh, rela uh, relations with OEC in other baskets. Like uh, economy also matters, right? Especially right now, and um, uh, OEC can further uh, facilitate dialogue and cooperation between uh, uh, countries in the region, and which can in turn contribute in regional uh, stability and security because economic challenges and social uh, problems still matters in, 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 uh, in the region. Um, the consequence of COVID-19, disruption of supply chain, et cetera. I mean, the, the fight of, uh, with poverty has been, uh, kind of has been, um, uh, uh, worsening in, in the region. And uh, um, uh, for, for sure, OEC uh, may facilitate uh, uh, the, the program uh, of uh, fighting with poverty in the region, uh, uh, facilitate some measures of um, how we can measure poverty, etc. So it's a, a lot of a lot of activities OEC May help the region and uh, the region states. Um, uh, again, um, region economic integration and diversification still matters for OEC uh, because OEC, uh, by by the, by this name, is not only security matter but also cooperation matter. So um, uh, uh, I'm constantly asked whether. Um, um, this this time to time high criticism coming from OEC and the uh, focus on human rights is it uh, irritation or facilitation for Central Asian states? From my perspective, for sure, um, that's may I mean that's strengthen political uh, institution and promote accountability in the region for sure. Um, so the OEC can support, I mean, uh, can support good governance in Central Asia by providing technical assistance and expertise on, on, uh, on issues such as, as election monitoring and political reforms. This is my, uh, this is what I believe. Um, uh, and the, uh, from from economic perspective, OEC can support economic development by providing expertise on issues such as trade, investment, energy security, 
So it um, can help to promote economic growth and create jobs in the region. And uh, 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 if we talk about security issues, um, uh, transnational terrorist groups may continue to pose a threat to the region, particularly in, in areas what already mentioned, bordering Afghanistan. So despite global focus on is directed to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and the West, security and humanitarian situation in Afghanistan is a matter of serious concern for Central Asian states. So, and uh, uh, I don't remember who mentioned, but climate change, um, uh, it's very important and still uh, highly under, uh, underestimated in the, in, in the region. Uh, 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 and and what, what, what we see and, and we conduct um, on a regular basis research on this issue, the uh, Central Asian region is uh, one of the most fragile in this term. And the t temperature is increasing um, and this is, there is no any uh, enough effort to stop, um, to, 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 I mean, to mitigate all these um, uh, climate change consequences. And, uh, uh, and, and this could impact agriculture, water resources, and energy production, and could pose challenges to economic development and social stability in the region. So it's for sure. So OEC may contribute in this, uh, in this uh, direction as well. And again, uh, talking about, for, example, uh, for instance, Central Asian uh, identity. Uh, this is uh, one of the main questions for now, because uh, can we uh, pose themselves as a Central Asians, or we are mostly talking about, I mean, we, we can say like in Europe, we are Europeans. So who we are, we are mostly, um, Kazakh, Uzbeks, Kyrgyz. So we don't feel that we are Central Asians. So it's it's again about our Central Asian identity, who we are. And there is still not enough researches on uh, sociological uh, researches, um, cultural researches, what kind of values we share, what uh, values uh, unite us and and may and, and could divide us. So it's a uh, you know a lot of things we can could be facilitated by OEC or um, I mean um, a, 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 if I'm not mistaken there is a uh, OEC think tanks association right. So it's a uh, we can we can cooperate in many aspects of this cooperation between OEC and Central Asia, not only focusing on uh, political issues, but again, sooner or later, it, uh, it, it uh, convert to political issues. So it's, uh, you know, everything is high, uh, tightly overlapped and, and interconnected. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Irkin, and that, that's a very important uh big point um, on the community, you know, can we build a community in Central Asia and uh, do we want to be part of this bigger community that OSC uh, rep represents? Um, so, but uh, let me... Uh, uh, Nargis, can yeah. I just add something? Because uh, it's already mentioned, yes, I, I very quickly, that there is a, I, 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 I see, it, there is a growing demand and desire to, to be as an integrated region, that's for sure. That's very good, good to hear. Um, <clears throat> so I have one, one big question um, to, to all, the, uh, all the panelists. So if, I, I guess it's fair to say that OSC is undergoing a big, uh, big crisis, existential crisis. Um, can OEC reinvent, reinvent of itself and whether Central Asia can be part of this uh, reinvention uh, in, in your view? Uh, we talked about the borders, you know, whether where the border is, you know, is it 
on the border with Afghanistan, on the border with China? What, what, what is kind of what you think uh, can be done under these circumstances? You know, it's crisis, but it's also an opportunity. Who wants to? Uh, who wants to start? Look, if if you yeah, if yes, you yes, yes, me to start because it's uh, I can I can say something slightly provocative. Uh, I think in the community of those people who are still dealing with the OSC, and this is not a large community, of course, except for people who are getting paid for it, uh, we see some kind of self-humiliation. You know, if you take a look to uh, the report that the Center for OSC Research brought out last year, half of the people were writing about uh, the OSC, is it, is it over, whatever. The OSC was on a, on a low intensity course for nearly 20 years between 2006 and 2013, 14, and then came out of it, uh, gained additional legitimacy through addressing the Ukrainian issue and, uh, and uh, will regain its legitimacy. Uh, very cleverly, nobody really wants to abolish uh, the OSC. Nobody wants, no, no, there are people who want to kick the Russians out of the OSC but uh, a good number of delegations very clearly are of the view, including the US delegation early on, that there is no way for this and there is no reason for this. Uh, the communication channels must remain open. As a consequence, I see a crisis, yes, uh, because obviously, uh, and Wolfgang Zerner wrote an excellent piece on this lately, uh, it's absolutely right to say that what happens in front of our eyes uh, due to this war of aggression is contradicting to everything what the OSC has been standing for. And this is a large scale organized massive war that uh, should not have happened, which deprives uh, Europe of its chance to become ever a security community. Uh, and of course, it will be very difficult to find a way to treat Russia unless there are some fundamental changes over there in that country. So, uh, but I would not uh, close shop on the OSC. I would say it's an opportunity, it's a chance. There is a big issue over there, obviously, and that's related to the human dimension. Although we don't have a dimensional debate, I think it's fairly uh, unfortunate when a number of countries are challenging those values that we are supposedly all standing for and that the countries have signed up to. You know, Yerkin uh, Tukumov is sitting in the city where it was reconfirmed on December 2, 3, 2010, you know, so we should not underestimate all these, all these factors, but I don't think the OSC, uh, the, as, the, as the Russians left the, the Council of Europe, the OSC is or the more important, uh, to unite 57 uh, countries and provide a channel. Thank you. But can I press you a little bit more um, on that? What would be your formula for reinvention, if you have one? Oh, it's it's just just keep going, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, look, I, I have to tell you that yesterday I had a, a, a presentation to an American audience in, in Ohio, which were all wearing uniforms, uh, the future defense attaches, OVC chiefs. And I said to them, look, unless the borders are going to be identical with the uh, established, constitutionally established borders of Ukraine, uh, there is going to be a huge need for observers and monitors who stabilize the situation and which other venue is more equitable than the OSC. So I think uh, the need for the OSC uh, will come back uh, to, to us. I, I have slightest doubt. We don't have to reinvent something. Of course, intellectuals always want to reinvent something. and uh, But uh, sometimes it just happens. We have to be vigilant and we have to be prepared uh, for the eventuality when, when the OSC can make a difference. And it happened several times in the past. I'm unfortunately old enough to remember uh, how instrumental the OSC was. You take the Vienna uh, follow-up meeting of 1986-1989, how much it 
uh, predated the, the fundamental change of the, of the equation in Europe. So uh, yes, the OSC is, is there and is supposed to be there. And I noticed that my colleagues would like to speak and I would rather shut up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can, can we go to, I, I saw Stefan's uh, hand first and then to you again. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I just want to echo uh, uh, what, what Paul was saying. I mean, this is really not a question about reinventing uh, something. That right now, I, I think the, the main problem is that the OSCE and, and its structures, but also its participating states, are both consumed by the crisis in Ukraine and at the same time paralyzed by it. Um, so I think what is needed now is if you want sort of a midterm survival strategy um, that actually acknowledges where we are uh, at the moment uh, and tries to find ways around it that don't just you know put plasters on uh, uh, on wounds. Uh, so obviously, I mean, the budget is a problem. The fact that we don't really have a troika right now in the traditional sense. That it's not entirely clear what will happen uh, uh, at the end of this year with uh, sort of the key positions uh, in the uh, in the secretariat. Uh, so I think all of these are clearly issues that can be foreseen now, uh, and where the organization and the participating states, especially those that uh, have been traditionally very strong supporters of the OSCE, really need to come together and and come up with a solution and. Here again, I think Central Asia is really important in the sense that um, the states of Central Asia um, in many ways are maybe to differing degrees uh, very strong supporters, but also beneficiaries uh, of the OSC in the sense that that is actually one of the few fora in which they can genuinely participate as sovereign equals uh, uh, among the 57 uh, uh, other states. And as, as one of you said earlier, uh, um, I think in a way the OSCE also, because of its large uh, uh, membership, can potentially sort of create um, you know, a backstop uh, uh, for the countries of uh, uh, Central Asia to organize themselves and not to you know, fall from a Russian dependency straight into a Chinese uh, dependency. So I think there are lots of options, but in the end, given how the OSCE is structured, it will really come down what the participating states actually allow uh, the institutions uh, uh, to do. And here, I would hope that there can be more uh, uh, dialogue and more engagement east of Vienna as well, so that in the end, it's not just you know the Swiss, the Austrians, and the Germans that. Um, keep uh, the situation alive. Yes, that's. I, I think that's an excellent point. These are new, well, these are fairly uh, young states and they are undergoing uh, processes of nation state building. So uh, it, it seems, you know, kind of, I, I also believe in that, that in uh, uh, kind of participation engagement with OSC can be formative for, um, for the countries of the region and for, for the region uh, for the region itself, Yerkin? Yes, Nargis. Um, um, what really struck me when I when I was in Europe uh, last year that there is a, so many different approach to OEC destiny, like from uh, opt quite optimistic in Vienna to very pessimistic in France and uh, United Kingdom. So it's uh, still everything uh, they can it's challenge uh, 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 for for many countries uh, 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 with membership of OEC and uh, from central Asian perspective I think it's again it's not mostly about reinventing but uh, to find a, a better balance between uh, cooperation and security it's from a central Asian perspective yes yes uh, conflict, I mean, especially border conflict resolution uh, really matters for Central Asia. Uh, terrorism and um, um, find ways to cope with Afghan um, and, uh, itself and the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan matters, but uh, economic cooperation in, in, in the region, infrastructure 
projects and uh, facility is very even more important for 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 Central <laughs> states. So it's a uh, let's uh, let's think about more balance at the um, uh, Central Asian cooperation. Yes, Paul had a comment. I just wanted to mention one thing that I, I really feel strongly about cooperation before integration. You need normal cooperation. Very often cooperation is facilitated by internal changes in the countries. We saw a number of very positive internal changes. We had two summits uh, of the five Central Asian states. Once actually we had to go to Turkmenistan in order that Turkmenistan would be represented on the top level, but we had the Cholponata summit. Uh, we don't know too much about it, but we do know that uh, precisely what we started to discuss here, the decline of Russia uh, in the current uh, situation was an issue on the agenda of the five presidents. And that's an important thing. You adapt together to a very challenging environment and uh, measure what uh, the, 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 the individual countries are supposed to do and, and what is in their best interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alexandra, I saw your, your, your hand in the, yeah, yes. Yes, I think the situation has shown that the OEC cannot prevent a war. However, this shouldn't discourage us because once the war is over and we all want to hope that this happens rather sooner than later, I think the OEC will be a crucial platform and its reaction to multiple crises since its inception uh, has shown that it's uh, it's a unique platform, really, that as uh, many of my conversations here in Vienna with the OEC secretariat employees uh, have shown, even if the organization ceased to exist, it would have been reinvented the, the next day, just because it's it's really the most viable format, I think, where those um, different partly clashing interests in this particular case, in, in the case of Russia's war against Ukraine clashing up to the extreme, and of course, Russia broke all rules and all norms that it subscribed to. But once warring parties, with the help of their respective allies, I hope will find a way to end the war, OEC will, um, the toolbox of the OEC will be, I think, the first that will be used and just final word for me, the big challenges that I already mentioned, big planetary challenges that transcend borders, like climate change, like migration, arms proliferation, many, many other, they require joint approaches, cooperative approaches. So thus, to me, maybe it's very optimistic, and perhaps we have to look in a distant future to imagine that, but the cooperative security approach, it's not going away. And OEC has always been an organization that unites countries with let's say different regimes <laughs> and the subscription to human rights and democracy, et cetera, is maybe in some cases lip service or something that is interpreted very differently. But this is to me not, not a, um, an obstacle. It's rather an opportunity to pragmatically cooperate even among countries that are you know, uh, not like-minded and the OEC is a crucial platform. So I hope that it will manage to kind of hibernate now perhaps or survive like previous speakers mentioned, in order to, you know, provide a platform for dialogue once the war is over. I'm not sure it can afford to hibernate, but we got a, <laughs> we got, um, a provocative question. Um, can panelists com comment on practical reform of the OEC that might make it more effective, a more effective organization, especially in Central Asia? For instance, should the name be changed to Organization for Security and Cooperation in Eurasia rather than in Europe in the title and expand to include Mongolia, Afghanistan, even China, maybe more and make it less Eurocentric, which perpetuates the impression Europe is superior to the rest of the world? So, and yes, Stefan, Stefan can we go to you? Well, the, the easiest the easiest part of the answer is well actually Mo Mongolia is already uh, a member of or a participating state of the uh, uh, OSCE. Um, I will also uh, uh, in a second uh, uh, ask um, the um, Davis Center uh, to post a link to um, to another report that uh, uh, the uh, center uh, the the OSCE uh, network uh, um, uh, published uh, a few years ago about. Uh, the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative on the OSCE uh, region. Um, and in this uh, uh, particular report, we looked at, <clears throat> excuse me, future 
uh, uh, relationships uh, uh, between the OSCE and uh, China. Um, and I mean, it's interesting because, um, I mean, you could think of a, a potentially China becoming uh, one of the Asian partners for cooperation, uh, uh, which is already an existing framework within the OSCE. But there the problem then obviously is what would the other uh, Asian partners for cooperation uh, uh, actually think about that? So, uh, I mean, would Japan uh, or Australia be particularly happy to see uh, China um, as, a, as a peer partner uh, in, in relations with the OSCE? Where there are actually quite useful and constructive contacts uh, uh, with China is at a more institutional level uh, between the OSCE and the SCO, uh, even though that has declined ever so slightly uh, since the previous uh, Secretary General uh, uh, Vladimir Norov uh, uh, stepped down from, from the role as um, uh, the General Secretary of the uh, SCO. Uh, but nonetheless, I think there are uh, certainly options. And I also do think that it's actually important to think about uh, uh, China in the context um, that a lot of issues that are being discussed in the OSC and that affect the OSC also have a very clear uh, China dimension uh, to it. So from that perspective already, I, I think the OSC cannot afford uh, to ignore uh, China. Whether that next necessarily means thinking about Chinese membership, I'm not so sure that that is um, going to be enthusiastically embraced by uh, a lot of uh, OSCE participating states, especially those west of uh, uh, Vienna. Um, so I think we have to be realistic there. But from my perspective, certainly uh, more constructive and potentially more institutionalized and formalized dialogue with China would certainly be useful not least uh, uh, also for the Central Asian uh, participating states. Final point, Afghanistan since 2003 has been uh, an OSCE um, uh, Asian partner for cooperation. Right now, I think it's highly unlikely uh, uh, given how uh, the situation in Afghanistan itself is developing that that will manifest itself in any meaningful uh, uh, way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Paul. Huh? I will say something that most people will not like, maybe. The first thing is, if we go back in history, what are the things that we have not experimented with, what we have not thought about concerning the OSC? We thought about so many things. Uh, Daniel Rothfeld, uh, 20 years ago, came up with the idea that uh, we should revise the Helsinki Final Act and have a new foundation. Uh, basically, I think 95% of the text would be identical. Uh, or there are things that we badly need. Abolishing consensus, no way. It's one of the main strengths of the OSC that there is consensus. And as a consequence, small countries are also part of this inner circle, de jure, even if not de facto. Uh, that's important. Uh, name why would it mean anything when we, we were very happily taking the five Central Asian states? There was some opposition, some very well-known uh, Russian colleagues uh, who are decades-long uh, observers of the OSC and commentators said that uh, the Central Asian states should not have been taken uh, because uh, they are not meeting requirements. I think the, some of the Central Asian states meet the requirements more than some other. Uh, countries, uh, I don't have to give the name, of course, uh, or names. Uh, yes, we can we can do window dressing. We can say, okay, the Forum for Security Cooperation is redundant. Uh, yes, will it change? I think the political processes and the readiness to cooperate with each other should be should be more there. Was I unhappy with something that I found uh, unfortunate or or? Contrary to the purpose, yes, I was of the view that uh, the Russian foreign minister should have been present in the ministerial council meeting in Poland. Uh, at the same time, I think that the Russians should be a little bit more generous in finding the next chairmanship country, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's much more the, the, the politics than the, than the formal institutional reforms that I think would help us 
uh, bring the OSC forward and uh, retain or regain its relevance. Thank you. And um, let's not forget that there is also SICA, right? The, the uh, Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia, where China plays, uh, plays an important role and Central Asian countries are also part of it. And Kazakhstan was also, okay, I think, a co-founder of the, of the organization. So we have this original kind of yeah, attempt to do something like um, uh, like OSC uh, in in Asia. So uh, we are very much over time, but Yerkin wanted to say something. So I'll give you uh, 40 seconds. No, no. Okay. I, I just, I, I will be very short that there is a uh, mention that Russia in decline in Central Asia. Well, I don't think so. It's, um, um, well, um, the strategy of Russia remains the same. So it's uh, in Central Asia. So, and um, we have to be friends with them. That's for sure. I mean, this is matter of our security cooperation as well. That's, yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> um, I would second when I, I think there is a decline and there is not in a sense that uh, Russia has less resources now, right? And uh, less capacity, but at the same time, there is more attention to the region and it will try to increase its presence uh, presence in the region because there is nowhere basically to uh, to go. So it's more limited now. So, uh, but 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 of course we need to maintain good working relations with, uh, with Russia. I don't think we have uh, much choice in this regard. So uh, we went over time, but I think it's worth it. Uh, we, uh, we discussed some very important issues and um, and uh, touched upon some very important questions. Um, let me thank um, our wonderful panelists uh, for, for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts and insights. Uh, I also want to, uh, to thank the, the people who tuned in uh, to this uh, webinar and who are watching us on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, and um, I want to, um, want to thank uh, our events team at the Davis Center, uh, Laura Sargent and Kat Green for uh, helping us uh, organize this uh, this webinar. Thank thank you very much and stay tuned. <laughs>